Welcome to MicroCollege, a podcast exploring innovative, place-based, and humanly scaled responses to the crises in higher education, meaning, and discourse in our time. Everyone knows that colleges and universities are at a breaking point. But what can be done? At MicroCollege, we ask this question to the people who are tackling the problem head-on, as well as asking accomplished people in all fields for their insights into these issues and what they think we can do about them. I'm Jacob Hunt, director of Thoreau College, a microcollege located in Viroqua, in the heart of the driftless region of southwestern Wisconsin. Inspired by the example of Deep Springs College, by the life of Henry David Thoreau, and by the ideas of Rudolf Steiner, founder of the Waldorf School movement, Thoreau College offers higher education for the whole human being through immersive residential programs for young adults. We also offer shorter programs for adults of all ages, offered through the Driftless Folk School. Hello, Liam. Welcome to the, the first episode here of MicroCollege, the podcast. I'm Jacob Hunt, the host, and uh, I'm here today. Uh, we're just going to talk uh, with, with Liam McGilligan, who is uh, a recent alumni of, of Thoreau College and was the producer of this podcast. Um, we thought today we'd just get things started by, by defining our terms. So what is a microcollege? Telling a little bit about my story um, as the founder of the college, um, describing Thoreau College a bit, and, and our goals for this podcast. Yeah, so we, we've thought through some questions, and uh, um, so why don't you take it away, Liam? Well, um, our, our podcast is called Micro College. Our college is classified, self-classified as a micro college. Um, Jacob, could you tell us what is a micro college? Well, Liam, um, many of the listeners uh, may never have heard that term before, um, not surprisingly. Um, uh, it is a, it's a term that we are trying to, to spread, uh, a concept we're trying to spread, a good idea we're trying to let uh, have more people know about. Um, so uh, there's, there's a few different organizations out there which are using this term, um, and we'd like to, to, to give a particular definition of it. So um, one is micro, how micro is micro college. Um, I think uh, Thoreau College has had between... Um, four and about 18 students in the programs we've had. Our goal is is in that range, maybe 12 to 20 as a maximum. Um, other other uh, organizations we see as our peers are in that range, um, you know, 15 to 20. Deep Springs College has had 25 to 30 students. So that's kind of the range that we're talking about. Um, question has come to me recently about what's the upper limit of that, what would be considered to be uh, a micro college. Um, and... Uh, some of the other institutions that, that are inspirations for this, um, for example, the Scandinavian folk schools in Denmark and Norway, um, which have been around for over 150 years, um, some of them get up to the size of maybe 100 to 150 students. And I would say I would consider that to be also a micro college. Um, what we're dealing with here are um, are scales of human communities that have real solid basis in in social science theory and in anthropology. Um, there's a concept known as uh, Dunbar's number, which is 150 people, which is um, the unit of, of a community where everyone can have some sort of relationship, face-to-face -face relationship. If you get beyond that level, then you are in the realm of, of, a, of a community where you're, it's an imagined community in some sense, right? Um, so, or another way to think of it is, uh, you know, 25 to 30 people up to maybe 50 people you could say is a band right a hunter gatherer band up to 150 you might think of a clan right somebody had, where you really know the members there and beyond that you're you're beyond that level so i would say yeah that that's that's the range um and uh what about a college right so um we are in this podcast we're going to be talking with people who have founded or who who operate um gap year programs folk schools um other sorts of educational projects that don't use this name, microcollege. Um, we, for me, the word college is important um, because it is tapping into a deep um, tradition um, of, a, of a community where ideas are discussed, where where um, there's there's an intellectual component, an academic component, you could say, in addition to the experiential and artistic and community life aspects that are also a really important part of this concept. So. Um, Many, many gap year programs, for example, are serving similar students to, to but who we are seeking to, to uh, serve, um, but with more of an emphasis on the, the manual or the expeditionary learning or, or uh, service aspects, um, which are important parts of what we do, but we'd like to emphasize there is an intellectual and academic component of this as well. 
Um, could you say more about, so the micro college obviously has an emphasis on some sort of scale and size of the, of the institution or the, or the learning community. Um, you spoke a little bit about what is the focus of the community, you, you know, social sciences, anthropology, the folk high schools. Could you say a little bit more about that? And also um, answer the question of, you know, where are micro colleges? Where do they exist? Where do they take shape? You know, um, what does the location of a micro college have to do with a micro college? Is that an important aspect in micro colleges? Or could a micro college, you know, be in uh, Manhattan? You know, would that make sense for a micro college? What do you think about that? Well, I think that's an excellent question. Place is a really important part of micro colleges, um, as, as I understand it. Um, and I, I'd say they could exist in Manhattan. Um, but uh, yeah, they would have a relationship to that very particular place. Um, most of the existing um, micro colleges um, organizations that we see as, as peers to what we are doing um, are, however, in rural places, um, including very remote places. Um, Deep Springs College, um, which is, is a key inspiration, which has been in operation since 1917, is intentionally in a very remote location in the, in the high desert of Eastern California. Uh, near Death Valley, um, about an hour away from the nearest town. Other micro colleges um, are in places like Alaska, Sitka, Alaska, or in the Glacier Bay area, um, in the Southwest, in, in Arizona. Um, and in general, you know, folk high schools, um, uh, which are another part of our inspiration, are generally associated with, with rural communities, with agricultural work, um, and with, and with uh, interactions with a particular place, place-based education. And I certainly think that that's one of the, the benefits of the micro scale, right? You can, you can uh, here at Thoreau, we are located in a town of about 4,500 people in rural southwestern Wisconsin. Um, if we bring in you know, 7, 12, 15 students into a community of this size, um, we really can, can, can functionally be a part of this community, the life that's happening here, the business, the culture, the, the schools, um, in a way that is uh, really the whole area is our campus. Mm -hmm. Why is this? Uh, why is this an important model, and how can this model help address different problems that we're encountering right now in the world of higher education? Why? Why is it important for? Why is there a different impact had on a community and on a group of students when they come to a specific place or they come to a remote location? What? What, what is unique and important about that uh, model? I think that one of the experiences that many people, including young people, have um, in our time is is the sense of being drowned in mass institutions, mass society, mass media. Um, and I think this has accelerated um, in the last couple of decades and especially the last couple of years with the pandemic. Um, you think about the model of education that many people have experienced online, um, remote learning, right? The 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 face to face uh, relationship is, is entirely dissolved. And that was, that was already in motion before zoom classes and Google classroom and things like that. Um, really, really, um, since the 19th century, right. Institutions have becoming larger and larger. Um, the experience of education has become more and more generic. You could say standardized, right. We talk about educational standards at all levels is a really important theme. Um, and yeah, and just generally there are more people in the world than there were a hundred years ago. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and people live in, in more sort of standardized, globalized kind of environments. So, um, I think that micro college, um, a place based micro college that has a, has a real root in a place, um, has a size that allows people to really interact, um, on a personal level is an important counterbalance to many of the trends of our time. And I think it's, it's something that, that people are seeking out consciously or unconsciously in many ways. Um, and, and I think um, there are many benefits to the reasons that these changes have been happening in higher education. You could say, for example, a, a, a large, you know, a Big Ten university like the one you attended, University of Minnesota, which has how many students? 50,000 total, including undergraduate, graduate, and postgraduate. Right? And, and so 40, 50, 60,000 students in one place of different levels in a big city. There's a lot of specialization that can happen there. People can, you know, you can really go deeply into things. You can build fancy, expensive labs. You can have sports teams. You can have artistic programs that are have a really high level. There are things you can do there. Um, and, uh, and you expand that now to the online world. You can learn 
many, many skills, you know, computer skills, technical skills, even, even, you know, through YouTube and things like this, practical skills, you can learn these remotely. Um, but what is lost is the, is community and, and, you know, the, the really important skills of, of living together, um, communication, problem solving, collective decision making, practical decision, problem solving, um, of the kind that happens on a farm or in a garden or, or in a workshop. Um, and, and, you know, the, the life that, that traditionally has happened on a college campus. Um, and so I think that there's a way that, that a, uh, small learning based communities, um, are, are a great, uh, counterbalance and, and not, not, not totally in opposition, but in complement to things that are happening on a larger scale. And I think we see our students, coming to Thoreau College already doing that. As you did, you went through a four-year program, graduated, and then a Thoreau College experience is a complement to that and an enrichment to that in some way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What is your story, Jacob? Where are you from? And how did you get into, how did you get into this, to this idea, start thinking about this? This is a lifelong journey of mine. Um, I'm a local here of southwestern Wisconsin, the Driftless region. Um, grew up on a, a dairy farm, classic Wisconsin dairy farm with a red barn and white house and some black and white cows. Um, but my family also um, was really interested in education. Um, and uh, at a young age, um, I was enrolled in and, and my family became involved with the uh, Waldorf schools here in Viroqua, the Pleasant Ridge Waldorf School. Um, which was is uh, founded by Back to the Landers, some of the people founding founders of the organic movement um, based here in in the rural southwestern Wisconsin. Um, people who were thinking very um, actively, consciously about culture and 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 uh, living, doing what Thoreau, Henry David Thoreau was recommending, living deliberately. Um, and so that was a real inspiration for me in, in all aspects of life. Um, then in, in high school, I was involved with um, with my parents and with a group of other families and, and young people, um, students involved with starting the Youth Initiative High School, which is a Waldorf-inspired high school here with a, a really strong role of uh, student participation in governance and culture uh, and, and designing of the school. Um, so that was that was a really a life changing experience. Really seeing a, a school imagined, designed, started, and operated from the ground up, um, and that that was um, yeah really empowering. And uh, to see the adults working through through different perspectives and practical challenges, um, fundraising, all the sorts of things you need to do to start a new organization has been really inspiring for me. And just the question of what education should be, what its role is in society, in a community. What does it mean to be a teacher? What does it mean to be a student? Those are questions that were really alive for me as a young person. Um, so out of that experience, 11th and 12th grade, I also um, I was out, went out looking for more experiences like that. And what I had the great fortune to find um, was Deep Springs College. Um, so Deep Springs... Um, was uh, almost 100 years old at that point. Started in 1917. Located in uh, southwestern, in uh, in uh, eastern California, the High Sierra. Um, very remote, very dry country there. Um, and uh, is is located on a cattle ranch, um, working cattle ranch. And at that time, had about 25 students. Um, students are there on, on full scholarship, and when they get there, they're they're participating in a, a really holistic curriculum, which they describe as having three pillars labor, academics, and self-governance. Um, meaning labor, the students are working on the ranch, uh, which includes working with horses. There's an irrigated, there's irrigated alfalfa. There's big gardens and a dairy and, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a kitchen. You know, the food is, is, a lot of it is produced there on site. Um, self-governance, the students are running largely the, the admissions process, the process of, of selecting um, faculty and designing the curriculum. Students are on the board, and students also spend a lot of time sort of governing themselves as a community, kind of regulating the kind of norms of their members, and and um, just learning how to how to run a meeting and how to how to be a self governing community. Um, and then academics, Deep Springs is is uh, is very selective, and it's uh, it's an accredited two year college. Um, students go on to to finish degrees usually at very selective schools, Ivy League schools, Stanford, University of Chicago, places like that. So it's a very um, a very rigorous academic program. You know, with a strong emphasis on on original texts and on writing and on public speaking. Um, so it is it's a really alive kind of cultural like intellectual space as well. So that was the perfect place <laughs> to follow up my high school experience, um, and uh, and also was a place where where new models of higher education were being discussed. Um, 
Jack Newell, the president at, of Deep Springs at the time, was a scholar of, of, of uh, higher education, experience in higher education. So I got to, to learn about a lot of other ideas that had been tried from the great book schools to environmental liberal arts colleges and, and, and work colleges. Many, many, a great variety of, of higher education was, was something that I, I heard about um, as a student. Um, I went on to, to, to finish my degree in, uh, in Eastern Europe at the American University in Bulgaria. Um, really thought more about liberal arts there in an international context. Um, I did a master's degree at the University of Chicago. Um, and then since, since then, um, I've spent about 15 years as a high school teacher at the Youth Initiative here back in, in Wisconsin. Um, and also during that time, um, I was working, I was a college counselor. So I was advising high school students coming out of this alternative education environment about their next steps after high school. Um, and, 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 and generally, you know, found it to be a difficult task. Um, found, found many students who were, who were excellent high school students, really interested in the world, interested in service, um, interested in the arts, and, and, and having a hard time finding the, the, the right place to go. And, or going somewhere, doing pretty well usually, but also being frustrated by, by the environment, by how much it costs, um, by the anonymity of a big university environment. Um, and, uh, and generally wishing that there were there were better options out there. So, and th my my sense was that that was getting worse, right? That there were there were definitely more. Um, there was a need for some some different forms of higher education. So that was that was really important um, inspiration. Um, along the way, I should mention um, during that same time, um, I got involved with starting a a folk school here. Um, the Driftless Folk School was started in two thousand six. Um, and during that process, I learned about the, um, the Scandinavian folk high school movement, um, which in many ways is a micro college movement going back into the 19th century. Um, and also a movement that has, has had um, a number of roots, uh, another number of um, uh, locations where it's been picked up in, in the United States and uh, in Scandinavia and in this country has had a really big cultural impact that a lot of people don't know about and should know about. It's something I think that is increasingly um, important in our, in our time moment in history and we have got great kind of cultural divisions and political divisions in our in our country so you have really been steeped in this question your entire life um you you grew up in coon valley wisconsin about 20 minutes from viroqua you went to um you you grew up in a community that was sort of at the time it was was founded by uh uh, people who were looking for alternative models to all sorts of different things, to, to agriculture, to education, lots of people who came from large cities um, and settled in, in this region. Um, you went to this alternative high school, Deep Springs, American University in Bulgaria, and then you returned to the Youth Initiative High School to work there. How did those experiences and that journey, um, you started to talk about it a little bit, when did the idea for Thoreau College start to coalesce what of those experiences you had um you know you've talked about obviously deep springs waldorf education the folk high schools henry david thoreau when did those experiences start to coalesce into an idea for your own college and what impact did those sources of, how are those sources of inspiration starting to manifest in the college yeah, th this is an idea that uh, that has been um, chasing me. You could say <laughs> it's been a strong experience of of something that that uh, that was emergent in the world. I guess I, I feel like really, really a strong sense that 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 is the case. Um, and part of that is a sensing of of a gap, right? Uh, a a need that's not being filled in the world, and also in this community. Um, having been involved with starting a high school perhaps is the logical next step is, is higher education or education for young adults. But, but also within the, the world of Waldorf education, um, which is this global movement of, of elementary and high schools. Um, you know, there's over 2,000 schools around the world, many different countries. Um, but there really is nothing that you could say is like a, a, a liberal arts college or an undergraduate college out there um, that, is, that is in the same tradition and the same is, is picking up these inspirations. Uh, and so that, that seems like a gap, an opportunity. Um, and then as, as we were mentioning before, the, the general trend of higher education towards bigger, more specialization, more, more expensive programs um, also calls, calls forth, you know, uh, it's a sort of a gap and need to, to counterbalance that in some way. And that was really showing up in my high school students. Mm -hmm. This is uh, 
this is a trend, obviously, that we is ha- has happened and is happening in education. And interestingly, that we've also talked about this year and explored, this is a trend in agriculture. Uh, forget the name of the Secretary of Agriculture, but, um, you know, it was the 1970s, I believe. He said, bigger is better. Um, so... Get big or get <laughs> get, or get out. out. <laughs> um, get big or die. Yeah. Um, Deep Springs has been around. Deep Springs is 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 a real anomaly, mm-hmm. right? It, it, Deep Springs comes out of an era in which that get big impulse was was just being born, mm-hmm. right? Um, the the United States at that time was getting big. It was becoming an empire with the colonial colonies in the Philippines and other places, right? Um, this is the time of Henry Ford and and the big auto companies and you know the growth of the, of the federal government and you know, ma- mega projects, right? It was bigness, you know, gigantism was something that was, was the byword of, of the whole world at that time. Um, so, so L.L. Nunn, the founder of, of Deep Springs, who was himself kind of a, you know, a Robert Barron kind of industrialist, a person who was building hydro dams in the West, um, also saw something about scale. And, and, and his language really was about putting, putting the weight of, of his his resources and of Deep Springs um, to counterbalance that in some way. So a visionary, I would say, in that sense, in smallness um, having a really important role, especially in the formation of people who would be leaders or people who would have a have a have an outsized impact on culture. And that was the goal of Deep Springs. Um, and smallness was an essential part of that. I think unlike almost any institution in our society that's been around for that long, Deep Springs was designed to be small and had no no part of its long range strategic plan was for it to double or triple or multiply or anything like that. Its size was intentional. It was appropriate scale. Appropriate scale is something that that I think is is really core to the micro college movement and also to the sustainable agriculture movement. As you're mentioning, right? This this is um, you know the the family farm, the 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 size of equipment. You know that these are these are things that have a real impact on the quality of of the work that is done. And that's also true of education. I think. With such a, a myriad of uh, influences and inspirations for the college and not so many examples uh, beforehand, you know, Deep Springs being an anomaly, but with, with, with so many different uh, influences and, and inspirations, what, what, what does Thoreau College focus on at, in their programming? What kind of programs has Thoreau College offered in the past? Yeah, so Thoreau College got started... Um, Formally, the the name came about, and the organization, the group of people working on it, started in 2015. So we're in, we're past the seven seven year mark in this development of this phase. Um, and in in that time frame, we have we've staged a number of different kinds of programs, um, including a couple of three week summer programs with very uh, people of, of a really wide range of, of ages, from people in retirement to to people just out of high school and to everywhere in between. Um, we've offered, uh, there was one year, a one year program called the founding fellows, which had people who were largely in their early, their late twenties, um, people who had graduated from college and were, were essentially interns or, you know, were helping us to explore the idea and, and develop our uh, mission statement and things like that. Um, and then, um, we've staged two semester programs in 2019 and 2020, um, which were really Traditional t- college age students, you know, between eighteen and, and early twenties, for the most part, um, and those were were really broad, um, you know, holistic curricula, including academics, um, with a real focus on environmental literature, books like Walden and Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer, um, so you know, and and sort of philosophy associated with that that type of, of uh, ecological awareness, um, as well as uh, you know, a really hands-on curriculum involving work in the Thoreau's Garden greenhouse and on the Compostela farm, working with 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 sheep and with chickens and with gardens. Um, also, expeditionary learning, so solos in the forests around here and canoe trips and hikes um, throughout the Midwest. Um, Self-governance, students being involved with decision-making, admissions, uh, being on the board, um, and then finally the arts. So and that has been singing and creative writing and landscape painting and lots of folk arts, things like basketry and spoon carving, things like that. So a really broad curriculum. Uh, we had so two semester programs 
2019, 2020 with that kind of focus. And then this past year, the program that you participated in, Liam, the Metamorphosis Year, which was a year long version of that, you could say, um, culminating in students doing capstone projects um, and uh, yeah, being here for a full year. Could you give us a picture of what an average week, what what an average week might look like? I know you just gave a number of the different examples of things that have happened over the last seven years. I mean, what an exciting opportunity early on to be a part of uh, really, you know, uh, founding a college and uh, thinking about what the mission statement is and all those sorts of things. Well, now that there is a mission statement um, and and more decisions have been made and. Um, uh, what what is a what does a week look like for a Thoreau College student? What are different activities they would be participating in? Yeah, that that varies um, program to program, and also varies a lot throughout the course of the year. Um, I think something that is an important part of our curriculum from 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 the beginning is our location and including our climate. <laughs> Here in uh, Wisconsin, we have four seasons at least, and um, and things are really different if you're in January than if you're in June um, in terms of the length of the day, in terms of the types of things that are going on on the farm or out, or in the greenhouse. Um, and and also that there there's we are working to be to be aware of the inner differences that happen during that time frame, right? A really an important part of Thoreau College is is an awareness of of, of, of the, you could say the inner life of, of the spiritual and and of its connections with the natural world. Um, so, but the 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 model that we've been working with you know, is really played out um, in the metamorphosis year um, was you know, really throughout the year as much as possible to integrate. The, the different types of activities. What we talk about as the, as the five pillars of the Thoreau College curriculum, which would be academics, labor, community, the arts, and nature. In the course of each course, but also you know in each week and each trimester or part of the year, um, those show up in different ways. But um, during the, the fall, um, the autumn kind of sequence, and that's this is now played out three times really through the semester programs and the metamorphosis year, metamorphosis year. Most days have some combination of classroom time, whether that's a discussion of, of a text that we've read or it's a creative writing workshop or it's a time with a guest instructor or a guest speaker. Um, so thinking, right, and conversation largely as, as a form of activity um, often is in the morning. Um, and then many afternoons we'll have something more experiential, whether that's working outside, working in the greenhouse, working on carpentry, um, or, or, it's, or it's a you know, the visual arts um, and, or craft of some sort. So there's an integration of, of you could say, thinking and, and doing or creative work. Um, Within that cycle, there there's times when um, we really go out into into nature in different forms, um, week long expeditions or twenty four or forty eight hour solos, and so those are like deep immersions in, into nature, um, from which you know you really can see students going out of that, going through those, and coming back with with a lot of like rapid transformation as they as they they see new things, they challenge um, maybe their some of their own kind of anxieties about things, and having more time to think basically. So those are periodic kind of punctuations. Um, and along with this, there's also just recognitions of the transformations of the seasons, right? We do celebrate and observe things like the equinoxes and the solstices and harvest and planting, things like that are also punctuated, you know, to really give some structure to time, which I think is something that in, in our kind of indoor digital kind of modern world, there, there, you need to really make time and space to, to make those observations. Mm-hmm. While the seasons change and the students change, what are, I think you started talking about this a little bit, but what are the core things, the core offerings of Thoreau College that um, don't change for the most part? Or if they change, it would be a big change to the mission or the personality of the college. You know, you know, uh, different, there might be a stronger maple syrup season one year than the other, and that might impact, you know, whether or not students are able to be fully immersed in learning about uh, maple syrup production and and the life of the trees and stuff. But what 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 won't change with Thoreau College? What texts are the core? What activities are will will show up year after year? Yeah, I think we um, so key texts that we have shown up every year um, included 
course, Thoreau, Henry David Thoreau's Walden, um, is is in some ways a template. It is it is a journey through the seasons, um, as well as an inner journey of of, of a person who's actively trying to reflect, to live, to live deliberately, to have a relationship with nature in a particular place. So that's something that we've read really throughout each program in some way, um, some at least excerpts of, of Walden. Um, another key text has been um, Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer, who is a contemporary writer, a um, person who's weaving together kind of her central metaphor um, her work as a botanist, she's a scientist uh, whose whose focus has been on mosses and on lichen and and, and plants, as well as um, she's speaking from a Native American and indigenous perspective on on plant wisdom. Um, so that that also is it's another kind of a uh, a key text that has shown up um, really throughout our through our curriculum. Other other aspects um, ha- that are that are consistent have been um, we've you know, always had some some work arising from. From anthroposophy, the ideas of Rudolf Steiner, um, who is the the founder of the Waldorf School movement and of biodynamic agriculture. Um, so the, those some sometimes show up in the form of arts, um, whether it's music or um, or eurythmy or visual arts um, or biodynamic uh, agriculture practices. So these are these are these are practices that integrate a uh, an awareness of the non physical, the the spiritual aspects of reality um, into into other kind of ordinary everyday ex- uh, activities. Um, and then there's the life of, of our of our uh, our manual labor curriculum. So um, that includes the, the Thoreau's Garden Greenhouse, um, which is a full commercial greenhouse heated through the winter. So we are able to do some form of agriculture working with plants throughout the winter, um, and in a really active spring garden garden season. Um, we also have a little flock of sheep, um, so shearing, slaughter, um, and just working with with pasture and that sort of thing. Um, and then our outdoor garden space; those are those are um, kind of the, the the practical building blocks of, of our of our of our shared life together. And then there's also a cycle of expeditionary learning as well, right? Absolutely, yeah. So the the um, Expeditionary learning, you know, really drawing inspiration from from the life of Thoreau, but also from programs like Outward Bound and Knowles, um, has been a key part of our programs. Um, and what is Knowles? Knowles is the uh, National Outdoor Leadership School. Um, yeah, they're they're, they're this. Um, the expeditionary learning as a field, as a, as a form of education, has been really richly developed. You know, I think more and more people are knowing about it, and it is it's a powerful transformational tool. So at Thoreau College, um, there are uh, conventionally uh, we've had uh, week long expeditions with groups, um, and then a sequence of solos. So the solos um, have happened each of the last three falls um, with with three or four. Uh, times when students will go out into somewhere in the local area, um, will be on, 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 a, on a rural property with forest. Students will separate out into areas and set up a little tarp shelter and a fire um, and spend between 24 to 48 hours um, in solitude and uh, in different seasons. So the first of those generally is in warm weather in August or in September, um, and then moving through October, November, and then culminating in December in, a, in generally a 48-hour cold weather solo when temperatures can, you know, it's Wisconsin here in the winter. And, uh, and, and by the time students are able to do that and come out of that in the darkness and the cold of that season, it's a, yeah, it's really dramatic to see what sort of inner transformation students come out of that with. Well, what kinds of students might be interested in these, in these things? What, what kind of students might be interested in Thoreau College and these physical challenges and mental challenges and academic challenges? Yeah, I think that that's the first piece that you're emphasizing the word challenge. Um, we are really um, our programs seek to challenge students not just in one way, but in in a bunch of different ways. Um, we we are asking students to 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 read and to think and discuss ideas. We're also asking students to live in community, right? Live together, and you know that that itself is 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 is, is a challenge. Come to decisions about about everyday sort of things as well as 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 big ideas about um, about the institution, um, but also physical challenges, manual labor, expeditions, things like that, and so. A student who is who is interested in challenging themselves across these dimensions is that that that's a really a core kind of a qualification or, or the type of students we're seeking to serve. Um, I think we're also looking for students who are just fundamentally um, interested in a really conscious, intentional 
active engagement with their education, right? Um, not a student who's who's seeking to, to to kind of play the game and go through you know and to receive a credential, um, but but instead who's who's seeking to to craft it themselves to live deliberately uh, to to learn deliberately you could say, um, and and to be involved with shaping the institution especially in this early phase of our development you know the this is still a a, a young evolving institution and and everyone uh, who comes through has a big impact on what happens here so that's that's especially um, so students who who are um, able to to uh, engage with a certain level of flexibility and of uh, you know and are excited to to help shape something to help shape the future of higher education really um, and beyond that we have had students um, at several different age groups and and students who have been at different phases of their journey whether they're in a traditional gap year coming out of high school whether they're taking a break between years of college um, or indeed, as, as you did, people after after college, all of those groups have been represented um, here. And um, I think we are seeking people who are uh, ready to live independently. Right. We have um, we have self-governing households of students, um, students who you know, where people are cooking their own food and they're they're um, they're maintaining their own spaces and, and living together with the support of staff. Um, so that's another important quality. This is a place that is trending towards the independent living end of of things as opposed to a place where there's a dorm parent or something like that. The greater campus of Thoreau College uh, is the city of Viroqua, Wisconsin and the Driftless region at large. What, uh, what, what is this region like and what, what makes it special? Why has it become the home of Thoreau College? How does Thoreau College as a place-based educational institution interact with the city of Viroqua and the Driftless region, and what does the city of Viroqua and the Driftless region offer to Thoreau College? Yeah, so the Driftless region is uh, is a real um, a gem in the heart of the upper Midwest um, that even many people living in Wisconsin or in surrounding areas don't really know about. Um, so the the story of the Driftless region, of which Viroqua is is kind of right at the the geographical center, kind of the the heart of, of the region. Um, the Driftless region is an area that was um, surrounded by, was missed by the the glaciers. Right, it is unglaciated. Um, much of the Midwest, if you picture it, is flat cornfields, soybean fields. Um, and and that that's true largely of the Midwest, but not of the Driftless region, which is a hill country. So there's there's forested land here. There's there's running there's trout streams, um, and there's a lot of topography, a lot of a lot of um, a lot of valleys and ridges, and and just interesting, um, unique kind of ecological niches. So within the the wider context of the Upper Midwest, and which is again right at the heart of North America, this is an area that is a, um, a real uh, biological and cultural refuge. And reserve um, a lot of biodiversity here, a lot of cultural diversity. It's very unusual as a, as a rural community to have um, political and religious and ethnic diversity in a small area, um, and so it's it's a really a special place, a niche that is um, that is um, that is serves really well as a as a laboratory um, for kinds of experimentation. Um, it's best known as a place of experimentation and of uh, in, in agriculture. Um, it's one of the homes of the organic movement. Um, Vernon County, where we're located here, has has one of the largest concentrations of organic farms of any county in the whole country. Um, it's the home base of Organic Valley, which is the, the the, uh, the biggest organic dairy co-op in the country. Um, there are many Amish farms here. There's many um, people practicing things like permaculture, biodynamics, um, various creative forms of orchards and vineyards and and produce growers, um, people growing flowers and silviculture and rotational grazing. And all of these different um, modalities of sustainable agriculture are being practiced here um, in a small area. Um, and uh, as well as the arts, as well as holistic and alternative medicine um, and, and, and education, right, of which we're a part of. So this is, this is a, it is, is a small rural community. It's still very agriculturally based, um, but it's a place where you can, you can really get to know people who are doing interesting and creative things on a very, very like personal level. And so um, students who arrive at Thoreau College, um, they're participating in the life of, of the organization itself, which is a small number of people, but also it becomes a conduit to people connecting with, with all the other interesting things happening here. So many students end up working for or doing internships with um, farms, builders, um, 
educators, artists in this area, um, and really participating in the rich culture. So this distinguishes Thoreau College from uh, something like a Deep Springs College that is by design isolated and is, a, is an isolated community. Thoreau College is taking inspiration from Deep Springs in terms of, uh, you know, maybe it's a liberal arts offering and its size, but Thoreau College by design, would you say, is, 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 is designed to be in community with, you know, the city and the people here and people practicing all sorts of different things as opposed to what Deep Springs yeah. offers. Yeah, Deep Springs is very intentionally, self-consciously isolated, right? It, isolation is something that a student who goes there agrees to for the two years they're there. There are, there, there are strict rules that the students themselves maintain about visitors and about travel outside of the valley. And it's, you know, when it was founded in 1917, it was it was just geographically isolated in a way that you know you, it was a real commitment to go over the mountain range <laughs> to go to town, um, and so yes, that is that's different here. Um, I think that uh, and part of that is is a is a change of uh, of of time and history. I think that when Deep Springs was started, um, many people lived in places like Viroqua, actually places with small farms and small businesses and and communities even if they lived in a big city you'd still live in a neighborhood that had that had that kind of life whereas that's that's not so much the case now i think that students coming here are able to experience a, a vibrant local community in a way that's that's pretty rare um so but i think that that uh yeah the 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 a big part of uh the asset of thorough college something that 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 would attract a student here is to participate in this community what relationship does uh, this podcast have to the mission and values of Thoreau College? So the, the idea behind this podcast, um, um, I really believe that the idea of micro colleges or whether you call it a micro college or not, right, institutions of this scale that are addressing the whole person that are place based. Um, this is an idea that, that I really believe in. And, and I think that Thoreau College, you know, is one of our missions is to spread this idea, right? In addition to 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 bringing people here to Viroqua, to the college, we also I'd like to serve as, a, as an inspiration um, to 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 other people who, who would like to, to have an impact on higher education um, and and also to 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 start to build a network of of like minded organizations, which is already emergent. If you go to our website at thoreaucollege.org, you can see that there's a there's a listing of micro colleges, a description of what we call the micro college movement um, that uh, that we are in connection with, that we that we draw inspiration from, and, and are seeking to uh, to collaborate collaborate with. And so we'd like to to also um, draw people's attention to those organizations um, to to build a sense of collaboration and and mutual support. Um, and I think. Also, um, this is a this podcast is in, is an opportunity to to start and to continue and to engage in a conversation about higher education. Um, I think we um, part of the inspiration for Thoreau College itself is a sense that there is a crisis in higher education. It's reflective of a deeper crisis of of our whole culture, um, and that this these micro scale college initiatives are a part of the response to that. And so, in addition to people who are um, part of Thoreau College and the people who are part of other uh, micro college initiatives, we're also going to be talking with people who are accomplished people, creative people working in all fields of life, um, engaging in conversations about what higher education, education for young adults um, might be like, right? What um, what role it might play in the communities that they're located in, you know, how, how it might be structured in a way. So this seems like a really a vital conversation and, and, uh, you know, by doing something out of the box, doing something that is, uh, that is, is, you know, modeling a new form of, of higher education this is an opportunity to really, to, to spark rich conversations about this whole field. So when are you going to write a book? <laughs> well, <laughs> um, that's a good question. <laughs> Maybe it'll come out of this podcast project. I think uh, every time I talk to someone who is who is uh, thinking about higher education or, or the kind of people I hope to talk to in this podcast, um, a whole bunch of new ideas come out of it. And so, um, so maybe that will be an outcome of this. <laughs> We've spoken about the last seven years of Thoreau College and all of the time and uh, experiences preceding Thoreau College. Um, what is your sense of Thoreau College at this moment? And what is your vision for Thoreau College in the next decade or beyond? 
So this is a you know, seven years is a, is a significant uh, time frame um, in in the deep wisdom of, of humanity in, in Waldorf education. Um, you know, this this is a, um, it's a it's a natural kind of phase. So I think it's it's a great moment to be doing something like this, a conversation about you know, which, which is looking at where we've been, where we'd like to go, um, and certainly that's that's something that I'm thinking about a lot right now. Is is what are you know, where what's next. Um, so I think um, my sense is that um, you know I'd like to develop programs that are longer form, a year, but ideally maybe two years, like Deep Springs. Um, there's there's a natural cycle to a whole year, and especially to repeat that at least once. There's there's a deepening there. You can see that that's a real you know there's a wisdom incorporated into those two year cycles. That's significant. Um, but I'd also like to to see us you know continue our, our uh, deepening of our connections with our local community to 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 find more ways for our our students and our graduates to to connect with interesting things things happening here through internships or through partnerships with other organizations. Um, and and also would like to see um, us you know continue to be to develop our position as a leader in this micro college movement. Um, there, there are several different initiatives to formally associate or to form a consortium of, of projects of this kind. Um, we're also a member of the Gap Year Association, which is a growing and thriving movement. And so I think raising the awareness of, of this model of education is, is, is a core part of our mission. And um, I'd like to continue to see us develop our role in that. What makes a strong micro-college? And what makes a micro-college a leader? in that movement what yeah well so first of all the 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 micro college needs to be doing you know needs to be solid in itself it needs to have be have uh, strong enrollment. It needs to be serving the students uh, that are come to it well. It needs to have a strong faculty team that's that's uh, that's welcoming and holding and designing these programs. Um, and but also I think it needs to have a strong sense of itself, right? A strong sense of its purpose and of its its curricular philosophy and and be telling that that story. So that's certainly part of what this podcast is about is is to is to begin that, you know, to, to pick up that work of, of, of storytelling and of of uh, of articulating the, the mission and vision um, in a way that that uh, that really can serve as a model and as as a beacon to other other people working in this field. So the a traditional university that I attended, the University of Minnesota, one could argue that the University of Minnesota does indeed have a strong sense of self and a connection to its place. We are the Golden Gophers, you know? <laughs> and obvious, could you speak a little bit about what you think the difference between that sort of um, self-knowledge or connection to place is versus um, versus what you're speaking about in the context of micro colleges or just a new form of higher education in general that has a focus on a place and has a self-assurance. What is the difference between those two things? Well, I mean, scale is, is, is fundamentally important, right? Appropriate scale. Um, and, and I think there is there are certain activities for which the scale of the University of Minnesota, for example, is appropriate, right? I mean, supporting a Big Ten football team right? We would be real challenged to do that here at Thoreau College in Verroca, Wisconsin, right? That would be hard for us or building like a super colliding superconductor or something like that, right? There are, there are certain activities which, which scale enables. Um, but there are many aspects of life um, in education, in agriculture, in food, um, and, in, in, and in the arts for which the human scale is, is the appropriate scale. Um, and, and that 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 is that's really core is is identifying what is the appropriate scale, what are the limits to to the size of something where where it can be done well, to, it can be done appropriately, um, and and I think we are in a small community here, and um, in, in there's a, there's a scale of education that's appropriate to this size of community, and and I would argue that 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 scale is something that. Um, is is missing for many aspects of life that people are people are aware that they're in institutions where they become they feel anonymous where details are missed in edu in, in agriculture this becomes really clear where erosion is happening where there's some sort of a you know a disease happening in animals right needing to have you know the the right scale is is an important part in noticing those things mm -hmm. 
how will a person participating in Thoreau College uh, be different after their experience? What what will change in them? So that is that's really down in the, in in the, in the heart of of this um, this project. This is um, Thoreau College is intended to be transformational on the personal level, right? We are seeking to have transformational effects on society and on this local community, but the individual student, their, their journey through, through their, their experience here is, is really the core, you know, the measure of what we're doing. And so to talk about this, I'd like to, to reference back to Henry David Thoreau, right? Why are we called Thoreau College? Um, a lot of people are familiar with with Henry David Thoreau as a historical figure, right? He's a he's a member of the the, the American Transcendentalists, right? Lived in the early nineteenth century in, in Massachusetts. Um, he's famous for writing Walden, and many people are familiar with Walden, and but they have not read it all the way through. Um, in in Walden, um, Thoreau describes his experience of living in the woods for two years, um, and what people miss of this is that it's a journey of transformation. Um, it's, it's a metamorphosis. Um, he, he enters this experience in a, in, in a real mood of despondency and bitterness. A lot of people pick this up in reading, reading the beginning of Walden. He's, he's bitter about his neighbors. He's bitter about the world. He is, he's sour in a lot of ways. And, that, and then people stop reading it. <laughs> um, if you follow this journey, which is, is a journey through the seasons, through the experience of, of, of providing his own shelter, growing some of his own food, and then settling into a very close observation of, of nature, of the pond, of the birds and the trees, he is transformed on an inner level. And, and that is, that's the work that he's doing there. Um, and I hope that that's something that, that students going through Thoreau College are experiencing through their, all of the different experiences, through their academic experiences, through their practical experiences, through their artistic experiences, through these immersions in nature. Um, that there is a, an inner journey, a transformation that they come out the other side in ways that they may not have been able to imagine at the beginning, right? The central metaphor that we, we worked with during the metamorphosis year is the, met, is, the, is the metamorphosis of the butterfly, right? Butterfly starts as a caterpillar, as a worm who's devoted all their time to eating, to, to really experiencing the world, taking in, in, the, in, the, in, in the natural environment, in its, its, its ecological context, and then going into the chrysalis in which that worm, that caterpillar is dissolved and comes out the other side of something fundamentally different and higher. And so that's the type of alchemical initiatory experience that we are hoping uh, to, to curate for students here at Thoreau College. Thoreau is the model of this. The b- butterfly is an image of it. Um, it's going to look different for each person, but, but that is a... I think one of the reasons for having a college, a college that it's at the human scale, that's held by a, a strong faculty, um, that in which that that transformation can take place. Okay, well, how fascinating! Thank you. Uh, that pretty much wraps up our first episode of Micro College, the podcast. And uh, folks, if you continue to tune in each week, you can look forward to more conversations like this one. Uh, learn more about Throw College. Uh, certainly, learn a little bit more about Jacob and and the philosophies behind micro colleges and all sorts of other alternatives to higher education and different initiatives that, that different folks uh, around the country and around the world are, are getting started on to, to try to address different crises we're facing when it comes to the world of higher education. So uh, folks, have a great day and uh, thank you, Jacob. Thank you, Liam. <laughs>